Thanks, Colin, and to everybody at Tank, which um, in my experience is mainly Colin, uh, for all of your efforts setting this session up. I'd like to say hello and a very warm welcome today to our speakers and participants and our audience. And I can see colleagues and friends out there, and it looks like we have a great turnout for what I hope will be a very fruitful um, and interesting session. Uh, the motivation for this roundtable emerged out of listening and talking to our speakers uh, and invited participants about their research, the issues they were facing and how best to carry out the work um, they were doing. And from my own work on provisional semantics and research with artists and makers, with um, people producing and working with museums as institutions and um, producing content, reacting and responding to histories through uh, material culture. The themes throughout all of these conversations was often about what stops us from making change and why don't museums, museums specifically, do better. The answers which arise over and over are about power dynamics, institutional control, and essentially, as the title of today's event asks, who owns what? So in the events bright um, thingy, we had several questions, provocations. Um, how can museums and heritage organizations ethically and sustainably co-produce and maintain collections knowledge being the key one? So as Colin said, I'm Ananda Rutherford and I'm research associate on the tank project, Provisional Semantics, addressing the challenges of representing multiple perspectives within an evolving digitized national collection, which is funded by um, uh, the tank towards the national collection thread of um, the AHRC. At the core of provisional semantics is the interrogation of how museums and heritage organizations can work ethically and sustainably with key stakeholders and audiences to co-produce research on collections they hold and what prevents this from happening equitably. These issues are particularly pertinent to the tank programme and the exploration of a digital national collection. I'm going to briefly set out what we're doing today and who's doing what. Um, so, as I said, the main question is, how do we do this work ethically and sustainably? Um, contrary to the order I set out on the event, right, we're actually going to kick off with me uh, in discussion with JC Nala to explore the issues and barriers that arise with physical, virtual and digital access and use when working with museum held art and artifacts and their source communities through her research and her work practice. We'll explore the expectations and requirements on both sides and how the traditional museum continues to operate in power in terms of authority, ownership and even in how openness is operationalized. The second session is a presentation from Andrea Wallace and Matilde Pavis. Their presentation will answer the same question, but through the lens of the law. They contend that when the law is misunderstood or misused, we get the impression that the law gets in the way of doing things right. And that is ethically caring for a collection, giving communities, although I would challenge the word giving, uh, genuine agency and opportunities for co-curation and engagement rights, legal obligations or legal liabilities are perceived as preventing collaborative practice or decentralised approaches to collections management and we all need help with that. We then have four brilliant invited participants whose work addresses many of the issues raised and I hope um, they're going to briefly share their experiences, react to the things we've raised, uh, their reflections, critiques and perhaps further questions or provocations. We'll then open up to questions from the audience. The emphasis today is less on how do I sort out copyright for this artifact and more what actually happens when I try and ask people engaging and researching and responding to objects in the collections, when I want them to sign contracts, agree to terms and conditions and legally own or control access to tangible and intangible knowledge and artifacts. So the first thing is me and JC, and there she is. So I'm going to introduce JC. JC is a researcher, curator and honorary research associate at the University of Exeter and someone I greatly admire. I met her in her role as acting keeper of anthropology and African collections researcher, but JC wears many hats and has a broad and fascinating range of interests. She's currently working on tracing Nubian archives through time in the Kenya and the UK, part of the Imagining Futures project that sees archives as negotiations about visions of the future, which we're hopefully going to hear a bit about. 
She works to open up African collections held in European museums using community action research, which again, I'd like her to elucidate us more about. JC facilitates processes that support community members who develop creative inter interventions and outputs from the research that they carry out within heritage institutions. So we're gonna focus on two of her recent projects, rethinking relationships and building trust around African collections. I should say welcome, JC. <laughs> say hello <laughs> um, at the Horney Museum in South London which ran from 2019 to 2021 to address some of the questions in this discussion. The project involved research on Kenyan and Nigerian collections across the Horneyman, Pitt Rivers, Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge and the World Museum Liverpool. That's quite a selection. In parallel to Rethinking Relationships, she was also coordinating a community action research project at the Horniman, and this project trained, supported and facilitated community members to carry out research of their own interests on the African and Caribbean collections at the Horniman. The outcomes of this project included, amongst other things, creative responses to the collection and changes in museum practice and policy to serve communities better. These projects have been happening at roughly the same time as the Provisional Semantics project, but in some ways I've always felt, JC, you were doing the real work on the ground with the actual objects and the actual people relevant to these discussions. Your work practice directly addresses our first question. How can museums and heritage organisations ethically and sustainably co-produce and maintain collections knowledge? So to start off, could you tell us a bit more about the ambition and intention of the, pro the projects and your work practice? So um, first of all, just to say thank you so much, um, Ananda and the rest of the team who have organized uh, today's session. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules, everybody. I mean, we're, we're all very stretched at the moment, so I feel very humbled um, to be sharing something small um, with you today. I think the, the ambition for both Rethinking Relationships and Community Action Research was really to try and understand what the barriers to access are. Um, museums are quite quirky places. I mean, one of the things that I often say is that somebody made it up. Somebody made up a database system, somebody made up a practice and protocols. And when we invite um, community members in to work with the collections, there's a, the very first thing that is required is a certain amount of translation. And this becomes even more heightened when you were working as I was um, completely digitally. So in, in both of those projects, uh, community members were in, in Kenya and Nigeria and, and the, U, the UK diasporic communities, and they weren't actually coming into the museum. So I'll just take us a step back to the last 15 or 20 years when museums across Europe were heavily digitizing their collections. Um, as we know, unfortunately, community members were not centered in this process. And again, somebody made it up. So we've ended up with collections on line that make a fair amount of sense to museum staff but don't necessarily make sense to the kind of things that um, community members would like to do particularly when they're faced with you know something that pops up on the screen so the very first thing we did with rethinking relationships was to actually collaboratively develop a toolkit um, with community members and the toolkit was to do two things the first thing was actually to offer a personal invitation to community members. You know, it's, it's all very well. We, we think of ourselves, you know, as public institutions, the doors are open. But, you know, it try, it, I, I see it actually in some ways as somebody stumbling across somebody's kitchen pantry. You would have no idea what the order of the spices are and the kind of things that people were thinking about when they were creating that system. And there's also that hesitancy at the door. So the toolkit was really, in, in many ways, a very personal invitation. All the curators created little videos welcoming community members, explaining how their systems worked, but also explaining things such as, if you email me, at the moment it might take me three weeks to get back to you. Not because I don't want to get back to you, but this is on average the amount of time it takes. So we worked with a really, really high level of transparency as to what community members could expect in terms of their engagement. The second thing, on the other hand, was um, when community members first encounter museums, of course, they, they, they come with immense knowledge, but it can sometimes be overwhelming. And how do they begin to engage with them? So we did quite a lot of collaborative work to come up with a set of research questions that were part of this toolkit. And for me, one of the great successes and learnings of it was when we were doing the project evaluation at the end, asking community members what they found most useful about the toolkit. There was one who said, 
the best thing was those research questions. I mean, who came up with those when actually she was actually one of the community members who was involved in it? So there's something, you know, they'd forgotten that actually those were their questions. So it was really, I saw our role as um, translator, facilitatory, and, and also encourager that it was possible for them to do what they wanted to do. That's amazing. And just as practice, the, the actual shaping you do of that at the beginning, with the way you set that out is really is really good to hear so clearly. I think you had you just put the toolkit up online, did I see? Or um no, no I haven't. Uh, what I've done is there's a series um, of six articles or blog posts um, on the Horniman website that actually breaks down the practice and the process um, uh, because some people have been asking about it and I thought, you know, I, I wanted to make it public. Um, if anybody would like a copy of the toolkit, I'm very happy to share it with them. <laughs> um, I will pop my um, an email address in the chat. Please feel free to get in touch. You're going to get a um, lot of response on that. <laughs> that's fine. Feel free to adapt it. For me, it's really about um, and trying to get it out there. The only reason that I haven't put it up um, online in that way. It's just the community members who were involved wanted some mediation um, between the toolkit being distributed. But yes, I'll put my details in the chat shortly and please feel free to get in touch. That idea of mediation brings me on to the next question. Um, and I mean, just to say, I do think that that very conscious, careful project design is absolutely fundamental here and something that we often get several steps beyond before we reflect back on what we should have done at the beginning and I think that's one of the things of project working at speed those things need to be really hammered out quite early on but you actually have trust uh in your the title of the rethinking project and I wondered how you conceived about what that meant you know how it how it threads through your um project and you and I talk about sort of the museum agenda expecting things of people and what we want to do but but that doesn't really necessarily is not, it's not necessarily conducive to a trusting cooperative relationship. I mean, a trust is, uh, you know, it, it is an ongoing and perpetually, something that you perpetually have to work on. So the first thing that I will say um, with regards to when we were looking at trust um, in, the, in the context of this project is, yes, I was a museum member of staff, but I am also a community member. And sometimes there was quite a bit of switching of hats going on in terms of my reflection. How would I feel about a particular situation? Also checking in with other community members because I can't say how everybody necessarily feels. And so what I felt um, was a tool and a lot of community members felt same was it was about transparency and being able to say yes this is a potential barrier and we acknowledge that and we may not always be able to work through it we have to think about other ways around it or acknowledge that that is where we are you know I'll, I'll give maybe what seems like a small example but particularly um, during lockdown if there was not a photograph of a particular object online it was about saying I'm sorry that photograph is not there and we're not sure when we'll be able to get that photograph of that object so it's it's by perpetually um, revisiting the terms of engagement and always checking in with what we feel was being communicated that meant we were able to, to carry on building that level of trust. And it's really interesting um, you talked a little bit to me about the boundaries of after a project, the life after a project and how that relationship continues. Um, and I think that one of the anxieties, especially around project working, is that museums dip in, find out what's useful and then leg it and then repurpose it. So I wondered if you could, um, or, you know, years later, suddenly repurpose it. And that's actually someone's work who's not acknowledged or who then has to pay for access in some cases. You know, there are there are complexities on the longevity and the lifespans of these things. I wonder if you could speak to that a little. OK, so I think, again, it was about having a, a, a sense of clarity. And that was actually quite on an individual basis. So to start off, there are some community members who felt very strongly that whatever they were discussing or whatever information or knowledge they were sharing or whatever they were contributing to, um, it was important that there was actually a very clear uh, time limit or delineation. So that if there was something that was to say, go up on a website or was going to be tweeted about, there were very clear parameters around that. And there were also things like um, Creative Commons licensing and, th and that which we used. On the other hand, you did have certain community members who I thought 
was it was fantastic that they saw the museum as a conduit to be able to reach a large audience and to reach um, other people in their community. So there's an, um, a very inspirational community member who I um, who comes to mind on that note. Her name is Sharon Barlow Massey, and Sharon had an incredibly clear vision even before the community action research project started that what she wanted to do was reach diasporic community members with her work and she saw the Horniman Museum as a bouncing off point to be able to do that and true enough the resources that she created in collaboration with the Horniman were so well done that she was then picked up by Art UK and has reached even beyond what she had initially hoped so it's really about looking at expectations, um, but also the other thing as well is thinking carefully about the responses, because sometimes community members may want even a time limited platform, but there's a very delicate dance. People coming to, say, for example, a museum website will assume that a community member has the same kind of resilience and infrastructure as the museum that is sharing their work. And um, a big learning for me, um, it was in one situation where there was a community member who put up an, an essay that was, was in some ways quite a provocation and there was indeed quite a strong response. And I personally had to spend a lot of time speaking to the people who were responding on behalf of the community member and vice versa. So these were when we had further iterations of the project, build in systems that allow for training and allow for community members to also understand the parameters when they are working through museums and using their particular platforms. I think that's really important and a really important thing to recognise actually because I think that within museums we can be quite casual about involvement as the next project occurs, as the next bit of work occurs, as the flood in the basement occurs and um, suddenly our real work um, is, is predominant and I, I think that is habitual and then it gets hived off to other departments to the learning department to deal with but actually responsible curating when you've explained it you should be able to maintain those things so I think that's a really really crucial point about this you know who does it belong to well you know it may be in trust but we are facilitating a lovely I love what you said about museum as a bouncing off point you need to allow that bouncing to occur but also manage risk and be safe <laughs> safe about I'm thinking about bouncy castles now <laughs> but, so, but also just to when you talk about who it belongs to um one of the the biggest things that I learned through this process is it actually belongs to the whole museum so and in collaboration with the community members so practically how that worked when we did the training um, for community action research the second iteration they had training from virtually every department within the museum so it meant that they understood what was happening in conservation it meant they understood what was happening with the digital team which may seem on the outset of it why is that necessary but what it meant by the end of the process was that the entire museum structure was invested in the work that was going on. And it meant that there were many points of contact. And it also meant that it wasn't down to two necessarily individual relationships, but it meant that there was a whole network of relationships that community researchers could tap into at any given point. No, I think that's I think that's really pertinent as well. I should think though many staff members could do with that. I don't know what other departments do quite often. Um, I, I think that clarity of explaining yourself as transparently as possible, when we just assume people want us to digitise our collections, people just want it and they'll be interested in what we're interested in. I think what you're unpicking there is really um, fundamental. So bringing it back a little to the digital and IPR and things, I wondered if you could speak a little about whether the digital hindered or helped you. And I know it's always a question of both, you know, it's a poison chalice and also a great gift. Um, and we often focus on access, but if you can also, and that is problematic, both in terms of connectivity, um, you know, access, actual literal access to during the pandemic, but also in terms of controlling those things. You spoke a little bit about it in relation to, um, to uh, people's roles and expectations, but I wondered if you could talk, because you said very accurately, I thought about the museum online offer. <laughs> it's quite, <laughs> it's very well digitized sometimes. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it, there's a wonderful Kenyan expression that there is no otherwise, and we had no otherwise. We had to work digitally. Um, so in a sense, 
I don't really know. Well, to be fair, we thinking relationships started in person and we did actually have a lot of face to face and in person, but um, community action research ran completely digitally. What I would say that it helped with was we had to think of things like IPR and how we managed things digitally from the outset because we were all, that was already the medium that we were in. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was incredibly helpful. Um, how it was also helpful, um, and this is one of the things that actually profoundly moved me, to be honest, through this process, was that because we were digital, the museum suddenly became a space for togetherness and for bringing people together rather than a site of separation, as museums often are, because we could have diasporic community members from across the UK with community members from Kenya and Nigeria all in the same Zoom room. And suddenly it allowed for a flexibility of interaction. And again, coming back to the museum staff, who yes, many did really enjoy also finding out what was happening in other departments. We could all be in the same room together. And actually for a moment, if I could ask you all to have a look at the Zoom screen, I'm just going to be silent for about 10 seconds and just, just take that in for a moment. So what I see is lots of little boxes and we're all in the same size box and we're all arranged in a very particular way. If you arrive at a museum for a, a project that is in, in real life and face to face, very often the person who may be handling it will be standing up and everybody else is sitting down. There's automatically uh, you know, a distinction. You're walking around the museum people who know them are saying hello to them. There's again, another distinction or a separation. You might have accessibility needs that are difficult to vocalize within a group of people. Again, they're distinctions. I'm not saying digital is perfect. There, there, there's definitely, if we consider neurodiverse um, community members and so on, there's particular challenges there. But the starting point of all being in the same size box, so it didn't matter when we had gatherings where there was uh, you know, the museum director or CEO, they were in the same size box as uh, say somebody who was working front of house and the community member and myself. And, the, and you know, I, I'm still thinking about what, the, you know, there's a certain democratization that happens purely from this setup, you know, despite the challenges that it may have. It's interesting. I think, yeah, that's very positive, JC, but the general complaining about Zoom rooms. Um, I, I, I'm, an, I'm an irritating optimist, I should, uh, should have warned you. <laughs> Um, I wondered if you could say, you see, I really want you to actually talk about the bad stuff. What were the barriers? You know, what what stops you? I mean, especially institutional, because I know that your practice is now informing more of the Horniman's work and how that they engage, it spawns other projects. But what did you come up against in terms of institutional misunderstanding, misappropriation, you know, contractual stuff? I have to say the irony of actually getting you guys, the speakers and participants, all signed up and what's actually in the contracts is it is slightly embarrassing um you know with permissions and things but you have to go through that with community members now and I know you're going to say transparency again but actually before Andrea and Mathilde talk about the legal aspects is I wonder what the practicalities have been the other thing is you and I talk about workarounds as curators and and I'd like to hear about your workarounds and what you make possible Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a major hurdle institutionally, and that's, um, that's to do with the fact that actually museums are public institutions. So there are certain accessibility things around, and I'm going to get, get, you know, really, this is on the ground stuff to do with, say, for example, subtitling, to do with um, languages that um, have to be available so that if, you know, a member of the public is to watch the video, etc. To be honest, that was one of the biggest challenges because what we had said in both rethinking relationships and community action research was do whatever you want, have whatever creative response you want and we'll get it online. I cannot tell you how many hours, days, weeks, months I spent doing, trying to actually make that happen. And sometimes it didn't work. So I'll give you a very clear example. We were working with a, a Nubian community um, and they're a stateless uh, community as a result of a colonial legacy. And so one of the things that was very important for them in their methodology is that their videos were in uh, Nubi, but they, and the subtitling only had certain translations so that not, because they were really, again, that bouncing off point, they were mainly speaking to other Nubian people rather than the general public. 
unfortunately, we were just not able to get that video um, onto the Horniman website because of all of you know the legalities and the practicalities of, of being a public institution, what had to be met in terms of um, accessibility and, and so on. So that was a really, you know, that was a really big learning curve as to where we where we hit um, some of those. You know, and those are hard barriers. There, there was there was no workaround with regards to this one, because if we had to fully translate the video, it would have meant that we were not honoring um, the community's wishes in terms of how that video operated. Um, but at the same time, there was no way it could go up in the form that it was. So, so sometimes it's about actually just realizing, OK, what happens in that instance is we realize what the strictures are with regards to working. And it means that there are things that we can't do. What they were, however, able to do um, was they were able to uh, relabel on the database. So the original labels remained objects which they recognized that were not labeled Nubian because of the stateless um, situation. And some of these objects, even the Nubian peoples are largely resident on the African continent from Asia, etc. So they were still able to, to challenge the database. But yeah, there, there were some things we weren't able to do. I, I think that's really interesting because I've been, I think, you know, influenced by you trying to be as open as possible and to start with what people want to do. And yet it's not just the institution, it's my own training, positionality, expectation. And then you get to institutional digital limits and then you re remediated other people's work and that's problematic sometimes to the point you can't use it I think that's that's a really crucial point actually about both access openness and owning that you you own something too difficult to share I don't know how we deal with that when it's so rich as well but maybe some things are only for some people and I think possibly Shelley might talk to that later so I think um I wanted to know what success looked like um you're optimistic so many of these things feel like they don't have any legacy, they don't, you know, they don't last, you know, is it making change, is it presence, representation, is it a feeling of ownership that is holistic and not separatist, is it, you know, what, what do you think success looks like, what did it look like in your, in your projects, and perhaps your latest project, the archive, um, the Nubian archive project. Okay, so um, in the interest of time, I'll keep it brief to just the, yeah. to one example from each. So success in rethinking relationships for me, particularly because there was so much about the project that was about um, access, um, but also a facilitatory role. So we had our Nigerian community members who were very active um, throughout the project. Um, and what happened was uh, a lot of museum staff, you, you know, with, they worked with, with the toolkit, everything was great. And a lot of museum staff wanted to meet them and said, let's have workshops between Nigerian community members and, and you know, the four uh, museums participating, the staff. And the Nigerian community members said, no, thank you very much. We've got everything we need. We've, we've got everything that we want to do. They wrote some blog posts about their experience of the project, but they were like, we're not really interested. And I thought, <laughs> yes. They did everything that they wanted to do um, and were able to work with the collections how they wanted to, but did not feel obligated in any other way. And I thought that's a level of trust to be able to say, I appreciate your project, but I don't feel like we have to be best friends forever. That's really it was it was very it was very um it's, yeah I was excited about that. And no, it is. That's very freeing and and a, and a view of ownership that perhaps we can we can let go of the holding on quite so much. I think that's a really interesting model. Um, the, the last question for me, and we've got, I think we've still got uh, three minutes, is just um, your ambitions for the future. How can we do better? What do we need in museums? Um, I love your idea of, I mean, everybody always wants a toolkit, but one that actually models transparency explanation seems less like a toolkit and more like just best working practice. Um, not working from a set of assumptions that we know best. Um, but I, I wondered what your, you, you've talked to me before about the unexpected, the unplanned and, and serendipity in these things and being able to facilitate that. So I wonder what your amb ambitions were, perhaps around funding or 
Yeah, I mean, I think it would be just incredible if um, if every project just had a little bit of leeway to to do something that was not expected. Another barrier we faced is community members really want, really wanted to do an online exhibition that they curated. Um, so it wasn't covered in the funding for the budget. I tried really hard. I had three rejections um, for funding applications. So I was again, it was something else I wasn't able to, to make happen. But in terms of what's exciting for me um, in Visions of the Future, to come back to the, the Nubian community members, we're now working on a different archival project and they are able to fully work in Nubi, which is just absolutely wonderful. So everything that they're doing is in Nubi. Um, when I'm in workshop meetings, I get a bit of translation that they feel is appropriate for me to get for us to be able to do our work together. But it's again, it's very exciting for me to be part of a process um, supporting what they want to do. And quite frankly, I probably know only about 80 percent of what's going on. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's a really nice thing. Success is letting it go, really. So letting it fly on its own or, or not. Um, thank you, JC. Hearing about your practice towards openness and transparency really unpick some of those things, the presumptions about ownership working within a museum. I think you are articulating a really fundamental change, which I know I'd like to see happen um, in the way that museums and curators need to operate as a sort of first step. Um, and, you know, I think I don't know, I think that's really helpful and useful and I hope people have enjoyed that. Um, the issue really is a sort of abstraction of ownership in art and artefacts, you know, even those legitimately, legitimately held in museums and cultural heritage institutions, which have given them agency, history and relationships beyond their current keepers. And I think you are a fabulous example of doing that. So more of this, please. Um, that was really lovely. The next 